I'm a carpenter from Richfield, and my name is Joe Sampson. And, uh, but I come from uh, a strange background of curious coincidences. This is my wife, Shanna, whom I hope you had a chance to make acquaintance with. And uh, she, we got married, and you know, like everyone else, fell in love, and and then a series of strange things began to happen to us. And we found, I found out that I was married to a little Jewish girl. Her, uh, and she comes from a Jewish background. And one morning I woke with an impression that I ought to begin the study of the Hebrew language. And I told her of that. And uh, and so we went to the different bookstores and found that there were. In Utah, it's kind of hard to study Hebrew. <laughs> and so we began a almost self-study course of a decade or more ago of uh, things Jewish relative to her background. In the process of studying Jewish things, I became involved in, by coincidence, I kept receiving uh, particular books which are very orthodox Jewish material. And uh, the things that I'm going to discuss today and things we're going to teach relate to understanding language the way the ancient Jewish people approached it. And so this lecture is going to be divided by way of an outline into three sections. And uh, whoop, try another one. The first section of uh, the lecture is going to be an introduction to a school of thought which is generally called Kabbalah. Everybody say that. Kabbalah. So you remember the name and the term and how it's used. Now what Kabbalah is, briefly, is a school of rabbinical thinking whereby the rabbis said not everything that is in the scriptures is understood face up that there are messages and <laughs> layers of meaning contained within the structures of the verses of the scripture and buried within the Hebrew language which is the language of the holy scriptures and so these rabbis determined to try to within their background learn to decode all the messages of the scriptures from all these different layers of meaning that they said existed there and this, this approach to understanding language and decoding it then, decoding the scriptures, is the school of thought called Kabbalah. Now in our day and age, when, we, when that term is used, it's most often used in association with the remnants of the Jewish tradition that's come down through the occult world. And uh, be assured, I'm not trying to push anything occult on you. Whenever something good exists or is white, Satan will always do what? take it and reverse it and show you its black side. And so much of the material which we have concerning Kabbalah today has come through that reverse filter that Satan's provided for us. So understand that I'm not talking that, I'm just going to be talking about the original approach to scriptural interpretation. The next session of this lecture will be, we will be addressing what's called a little known historical church document called Joseph Smith's Egyptian alphabet and grammar. Can I have a copy of that? For those of you who are not acquainted with Joseph Smith's Egyptian alphabet and grammar, this is how, this is what it is. While Joseph Smith and his scribes were working on translating the Egyptian papyri from which we now have the Pearl of Great Price Book of Abraham, they kept a notebook of the process that was going on as they began to look at the hieroglyphics in the Egyptian, from which Joseph Smith said, no, this isn't uh, just regular Egyptian document. This is the writings of Abraham. And this, these notes explain the process of translation as Joseph Smith saw it. Fair enough? Now what our contention is, is that uh, most people in the church are not familiar with this document to any great de degree. And uh, if they have become familiar with it, they probably purchased it from the anti-Mormons. Well, the anti-Mormons, uh, to make, give you a brief history, back in 1966, the Tanners, 
Lighthouse Ministries, you know, they're all little house down by Dirk's Field. The Tanners uh, arranged or were approached by someone in and out of the church, we don't seem to know, but someone got in the church historian's vault and office and took a photocopy of these notes, delivered them to the Tanners in hopes that the Tanners could use it then to embarrass Joseph Smith. The Tanners printed Joseph Smith's notes and sent them to specific Egyptologists and said, read these notes and see if Joseph Smith could really translate Egyptian. That's a pretty good problem because in Joseph Smith's day, they're just beginning to break the code of Egyptian with the, you know, the Rosetta Stone in France. And so ideally, Joseph Smith should not have been able to know anything about translating Egyptian because the first really Egyptian dictionary didn't come out until the turn of the century. You know, the real public one, where Joseph Smith or anyone should have had access to it. So they said, we're going to prove that Joseph Smith is a phony by looking at his notes and showing that he can't read Egyptian. So that's what they proceeded to try to do. And so from 1966 on, uh, these notes have been floating around in different forms in and out of the church. What we're going to say is this, that once we understand this school of thought called Kabbalah and how it functions with language, some very interesting things come out of Joseph Smith's documents, which leads me to believe, okay, that it's almost mistitled. The title of the notes were in Egyptian alphabet and grammar. What we're going to contend is this. Once you understand the school of thought in the Hebrew Kabbalah correctly, you will recognize that in the alphabet and grammar of Joseph Smith, there will be an Egyptian character, uh, usually a part or a partial part of a hieroglyphic. There will be a strange phonetic word. And then there's sometimes, as you can see here, with that little character, Joseph Smith has produced a whole paragraph of definition. And so the Egyptologist looks at that and he says, oh, he's just making all that up. There's no rhyme or reason to this. It is gibberish. What we're going to contend is this, that if these definitions of Joseph Smith are carefully studied, you will see that they are based in the Hebrew and not in ancient Egyptian, suggesting to the mind that Joseph Smith is looking at an Egyptian character and giving you a Hebrew definition. Now that should give you a flag to remember what language was being used in the Book of Mormon. We call that what? Reformed Egyptian, Reformed Egyptian because it was Egyptian character and a Hebrew-based language. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take you to the point and help you understand Joseph's notes and see them in a Hebrew light. Once this happens and we see how Joseph Smith and the rule is using language and how he is translating language, once we understand those rules, we will move from there into the Hebrew. We'll take a look at Hebrew language, the language of the scriptures generally, okay? And out here when we use this information we've acquired, when we've gone from the Kabbalah to Joseph Smith and then from Joseph Smith to the Hebrew language of the scriptures, out here there is an explosion of light an understanding concerning the language of the scriptures, the language of Hebrew. And there's some real treasures which I'd like to <laughs> share with you. But to get there, that's two and a half hours away, okay? <laughs> to get there, you have to wade through a forest of almost completely new material to your minds. It's actually old material, okay, ancient approaches, but you have to wade through this step by step, through this forest. And if you allow me to take you through that process, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised when we get to the end. And I think you'll see that Joseph Smith's alphabet and grammar is vindicated. You'll see that, okay, you'll see that I'm going to try to achieve three, thing, three things in this t presentation today. Number one, convince you in your heart and in your mind that Mormon scripture is authentic, restored, ancient material. Two, that Joseph Smith was actually a prophet restoring authentic ancient material sent from God and three that the, the words of the scriptures in and of themselves testify of these things and testify that Jesus is the Christ and that all of these all of the things of the gospel were known from the very beginning and are, and are encoded within the language itself 
Now that's the goal. I hope you'll apply your faith in my behalf so that we can try to achieve that. So to begin this process, I'd like to introduce you to the Hebrew language as we approach language and do it in a way that you can uh, appreciate it different than we've been taught in the Western world. In the Eastern philosophies, in the Chinese, they recognize that every one of their characters is a symbol, represents a story. What we're going to be suggesting is that Hebrew is a language likened to those ancient languages. In fact, it must be the base language. That which we would receive, or it must be so close to the base language that all other of these other languages seem to bleed out of it once you understand the system and how it works. So we're going to introduce you to the, uh, we won't have time to introduce you to all of the characters which make up the Hebrew language, but we're going to try to cover a great number of them in this next couple of hours. These 22 symbols along here, this col side of this column, are the earliest forms of written language that we know of. Now supposedly the Hebrews learned language from the Phoenicians, and I think by the time we're through you'll recognize it must have been the other way around. The block form of the Hebrew that we presently, if you were to open a Hebrew text today, you would see this, this form, the, what's called the block form. It appears after the time of the Babylonian captivity. We will be spending most of our time dealing with the very earliest form of language, these 22 consonants. What we're going to be saying is that once you have the keys that Joseph Smith gives you from his alphabet and grammar firmly in place in your mind, you will see that these 22 symbols are actually represent concepts relative to the plan of salvation. And that these concepts come in a particular order which allows us to see the, what was in originally in the mind of God when the language was created in the first place. Now to do that we're going to have to start thinking differently than we do in the, the Western world. If I were to write this figure on the board, what would you say it was? Well, I'm going to write, I'm going to erase the minus. Okay. Is that an A? Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you, what's it mean? You might say apple. Ant. It's just a sound. But in English, it represents only the, it's a flag for a sound, right? Okay. A group of sounds. Now we're going to be, we're going to so, show that in the original form, and it could be turned every which way, in the original form, okay, the A sound was reversed, turned upside down. If you'll allow me to do this. This is a chart which shows you through the traditional rabbinical definitions of what these characters mean. That is the original form of A. It's called a lef in the Hebrew. What's it look like? Cow. Like a cow. So the rabbi said originally it was what? An oxen. Does it look like an oxen? Can you see how they could get that out of there? Now we're going to start breaking your mind and teaching you to think in new ways. Not new ways, old ways. When you think of an oxen, what are its attributes? Straight. Okay. Now, I'm going to insert an idea here for you. In Joseph Smith's Alphabet and Grammar, he tells us that every one of his words must be looked at on at least five degrees <coughs> or levels of understanding. His approach is almost Pythagorean in that he is saying to us that the same symbols which we look at in one level, okay, let's say a religious way, could also be looked at in the Pythagorean sense. Remember that Pythagoras and Lehi were contemporaries of each other. That every symbol has to be looked at as if it could also be used in a meaning relative to government, or science, or the cosmos, or philosophy, or marriage relationships, okay, relationships between the sexes. And so language then starts to take on dimensions, and symbols have to be thought of in degrees. 
Okay. So the first idea that was presented was what? That the ox represented strength. So we're going to put down strength up there. Looks like that pen's not going to work very well. But what are the other attributes of the ox that you can think of right off the top of your mind? Work. Work. Okay. Could that be another degree of it? Power. That's almost like the strength of it. Endurance and all that idea. Now I'm going to throw, throw a little jab at you. Why do you suppose the Hebrew peoples, these ancient peoples, put oxen under the baptismal font? Represents the 12 tribes in the house of Okay. So in what sense did it represent the tribe? If I told you it represented the tribe because it represented the bull, or the great sire of that tribe, yeah. could you see that? Does that make sense to you? That's, I understand that's why the children of Israel, when Moses was on the mount, begged Aaron to make for them a molten calf, actually a molten bull, because that represented God to them. Represented God to them. Okay, you notice that two of the tribes of the house of Israel, both Ephraim and Manasseh, both used this, this oxen as their symbol. For Ephraim, it was a tame ox. For Manasseh, it is the wild ox. Yes, that is so. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you to make a jump in your mind. Here comes the jump. Since this is the, this is the rabbinical way of thinking, since this is the very first letter of the alphabet, who was the very first great sire bull upon the planet? Okay, so I'm going to make this jump and I'm going to say that A might have something to do with Adam and that Adam might have the attributes of strength and power. He might be the bull and the head of all the tribes of the earth. Could you see some degrees of understanding there? and that that same symbol might be used in each one of those contexts? All right. Let's move to the next symbol. We're going to go A. We're, we're going to learn the ABCs over again. We're going to look at this original form of the letter B, and it was pronounced Beth, like in Bethlehem or Bethel. Have you heard those words in the English? Okay, that come through. Over here, the traditional definition of what that word was is what? House. So we're going to begin there. What is the attributes of the house? What is associated with the home? Okay, the woman. If this is the bull, and what comes next? You got the, you got the woman, okay, and the children, right? And you got shelter. Okay. Now you, you're cheating on me. You've been to this before. I can see you're using the right words. When Joseph Smith in the alphabet and grammar uses this name Beth, this sound Beth or B, he defines it as being man's first residence. Okay. So we have man's first residence here. But what is that? What is man's first residence? Can, is that degrees of understanding? See, we got, yeah, we go back to the pre-existence. It could be some faraway planet from which we came. It could be the Garden of Eden, or it could be the womb of Eve from whence we came out. Can you see it could be either, that all of those are applicable on some degree? Okay, but I'm going to write, since we put Adam down here, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to write Eve. Now the next letter, you'll notice in, in Hebrew it goes A, B, G and not A, B, C. This is the way it was originally formulated, and the letter was named Gimel. What did the rabbi say it is? A camel. So if I draw it like this, better defensive end than artist, okay? Could you see that that could be a symbol of a camel?
camel's hump? Okay. Guess what Joseph Smith says? He gives us the phrase, ga mole. Notice that he's just changed the vowels. But the consonants are the same. And he says, ga mole is a prospect, a mountaintop, a place upon which if a man stands, okay, he can see in vision, okay, the fair prospects for the future before him on the plain for he and his children. Fair enough? So what we're going to be contending with is if you study these very carefully, you can see that Joseph Smith sometimes agrees with these boys and sometimes he does not. When he does agree, Joseph Smith gives us a much deeper understanding of what the original under symbol stood for in the beginning. Sometimes he, he says they're absolutely, you know, if we compare them, he says they're absolutely wrong. An example would be this next one. Originally, this was the shape of the letter D. Okay, this is D, and this is B, and this is G. Okay, in the Hebrew, it's pronounced Daleth, Dalet. Okay, now the rabbis said, what did it stand for? A door. Does this look like a door? Looks like a flag. Everybody says that's a golf flag. I don't know why, but that's what they say it is. If I told you that I think it's an axe, can you see it? Tomahawk. Every time Joseph uses the D sound in his notes, we come up with words like ha D's. Ha being the Hebrew form of the word the, okay? The D's. Have you heard ha D's before in the Greek? Stands for what? Hades. Hell. Regions, okay? Below. He says lower kingdoms, okay? We're talking about death the pains of mortality. Squeaky, squeaky. I wonder how that's going to come off on your tape. That's all you're ever going to hear. Okay? Now I'm going to ask you to just look at the first four letters of the alphabet. Because we've taken them and I hope I haven't tried to insert too much information and you think I'm guiding you too much. Okay? Look at those first four letters and tell me if you don't see a pattern. Can you see it? Adam and Eve, what? Come to the earth and have children and what happens? They suffer the, the fall. See the pattern? Yep. So what we're going, we don't have time to go through all of those now. That would be like a quarter's worth of study as you understand how we did this process of extracting these, distilling these definitions down. Looking at the Egyptian and the Hebrew roots, seeing the symbols in both cultures and how they're implied and then comparing it to Joseph Smith to distill these definitions down. But that's the process we went through. But what we discovered when we did that is this, that the alphabet then forms a progressive timeline of concepts beginning with Adam and Eve coming to the earth and suffering the fall and this timeline then progresses through the whole alphabet until down to the at the end of the alphabet we have the second coming of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the judgment of man okay so now we've said all right if language was so carefully crafted as to produce the outline of the history of the world, maybe there's something in studying alphabet that could lead us to understand things on the deeper, the deeper realms. To understand, you know, the phrase of John. Remember what he said? In the beginning was the, and the word was with, and the word was God. We're going to say that that is absolutely true and that these rabbis were tapped into that kind of understanding and that so was Joseph Smith. And we're, so we're going to try to explain it to you as we go along. So with that much introduction to the alphabet and how it works, 
you want to watch for certain patterns to begin to happen, especially in the Book of Mormon. The fourth letter down, da -da -da, number, number four was the fall, spiritual death, pains of mortality, right? So in the Book of Mormon, you want to start watching for certain patterns to develop. When there's something negative to be given to people who are suffering in mortality, guess what you're going to get? Four examples. That the number of times an example used is used relates to the number and the concept it is in the order of the alphabet. And so John would come along with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. War, pestilence, disease, and death. And he would give you four examples of what happens to mortal men, okay, in the negative sense. So watch for those things to come out in the structures within the chapters of the, the Book of Mormon. We'll erase this now and move on. I'm going to try to introduce you now to something some of you will find interesting. And it is the way in which these rabbis ordered the alphabet. They said that some of the letters were more important than some of the others. And so they would break it down in this fashion. They would take those 22 symbols, which represent what? Concepts relative to the plan of salvation. They, take, they took these 22 symbols and they then ordered them by a different kind of priority. Maybe you can see that what they did is create this little whoop. That one's not going to work either, is it? We're soon going to be out of pens here. That's fine. You can see that they create this little pyramid. Do you see anything strange or interesting about how many letters are on each level? Are these numbers familiar to you? Three, seven, and twelve? Where do they appear in the scriptures? Everywhere. Everywhere you turn. The reason they appear everywhere in your turn is it's tied back to a uniform system that relates back to the alphabet itself. In this case, they said at the top of this pyramid, three letters were a priority. And I'm going to write them here so you can see which one. A and M and S. I'm going to plant a seed. I want you to remember those three letters, those consonants. And think of a word called amios. Amios. Which, we will, which will come up in the alphabet and grammar later. Amios. Okay. Watch for the number seven as it appears in the Book of Mormon. I can think of a quick example of Helaman. Helaman's father gives him the records, which Helaman is now supposed to keep. He tells Helaman seven times in the Book of Mormon to keep the records in about four or five verses. Does that mean Helaman's not conscientious enough that he can understand it the first time he's told? Or is there something else being told us here on a different level? So Helaman's father will tell him seven times to keep the record. Then in the next verse, he will give him seven reasons why he is to keep the record. Using number again to support and amplify the meaning of the doctrine in the verses, back and forth. Watch for those patterns. And you were talking about Sterling Allen and the work he was doing with the chiasms. If you've seen those chiasms that he's printed in his little handout he sends out. Notice how many times the chiasms are ordered by three going in and three coming out, or seven going in and seven coming out from the focal point, or twelve going in and twelve coming out from the focal point. Okay? The chiasms are laid out under this same numerical system also. You notice, of course, that it re also relates to priesthood, organization of quorums, three presents, in a, three presidents in a presidency, president, two counselors, seven presidents of 70, 12 apostles. We've never been taught to think of priesthood organization relative to alphabet, but that's the way the ancients did it. I thought you'd find that interesting. 
Now, all this material we're discussing now is simply material to help lay the foundation for what comes later. And so we're going to discuss now, within the school of Kabbalah, four different approaches that these ancient rabbis used. These are new terms. Everybody say notericon. Notericon. Okay. Got that word in your mind. Now, I'll give you a definition of notericon. It's in your notes, and you can keep it. Notericon is simply this. Since each letter of the alphabet is also a concept, every word then becomes what? A group of symbols which represent a group of concepts which must have a relationship to each other. Therefore, every word can then be dissected into its component parts and expanded upon. For example, this is, an Eng this is the way it would work in English, and these, are not these ideas are not transferable, but I'll give them to you like this so you follow the idea. I have a word like live in English. Okay. If I'm going to live, really be full of life, I would want certain things in my life, wouldn't I? Life would be valuable to me if it was filled with love. So every time I use the L in a word, if I, I could insert love, okay? If I wanted life to be full of everything it should be for a man, I would not want to build my life on falsehood. I would want a life which was filled with integrity, let's say. Correct? I would want, if I wanted the fullness of my life, I'd want it to be a life of health, so I would want vigor. And since I'm basically a lazy son of a gun, if my life were easy, if money came quickly, and I didn't have to worry about it, right? I'd say I had a pretty good life. Can you see how I could take then, if, if that's what each one of those letters meant, that I could take that word and it could become four sentences? And those four sentences then could be expanded into a paragraph? If you can understand that approach to language, then you can understand in the alphabet and grammar how Joseph Smith can take one little word and all of a sudden he's producing a whole paragraph of definition on five degrees. It is that approach that's being used in this text. That is why the Egyptologist comes behind, not knowing this school of thought in the Hebrew, looks at it and says, it's gibberish. How would he get that from that little word? Because he's expanding on it and multiplying the concepts as he's going through. The next Kabbalic technique I'd like to introduce you to is what's called gametria. Everybody say gametria. Gametria. Gametria, all impressed with that word. What gametria is, is this. The he ancient Hebrews had not the Arabic numerals. And so every Hebrew letter of the alphabet was also a number. This created tremendous opportunities to m match and move and coordinate language and mathematics at the same time. And the, uh, and the rabbis, without any set rules, okay, the one school th would do it one way and another school would do it another one, without any really heavy to do these set, set rules, would play endless games then with mathematics and language. For example, if I knew that the letters which created the word Messiah could be added up to, this is a true example, okay, would, when added up created a, a total, and I knew that if I took the word serpent, which had entirely different numbers, letters, okay, but each word, cre when added, to all the letters were added together, created the same numerical total, guess what I could do? Messiah, Messiah would be equal to serpent, and I could use them interchangeably. If I didn't want someone to know, someone who was not initiated in the material to understand everything I was saying, I could simply insert the other word and it would work perfectly well and would be fair for me to do so. Yeah. New idea? Okay. This is the game. It is this technique which is making the translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls 
so difficult is because they're finding the Dead Sea Scrolls are encoded in these kinds of ways. That is geometry. Okay. Endless games with numbers. And we've seen already, you know, the threes and the sevens and twelves and how they project out of the alphabet in number of games and structure of chapters. Okay? The next technique is what we're going to say. Everybody say tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, you're so impressive with your Hebrew. What tomorrow is, is they're saying, if I want to encode information, I don't want somebody to understand what I'm writing, in a full sense, I can move letters around. And I can play the transfer the letters game. I can put extra letters in one word in a verse and then go down to the next verse and leave them out of the word below in the next verse and you're supposed to figure out that you've got to move those letters down to fulfill the fullness of the intent of the writer. And that's what we're finding in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's so difficult then to translate is because you, know, you don't come at it, what? Knowing that they're not playing with your head and with the language in the first place. But specifically for what we're going to discuss today, the technique concerning tomorrow that I'd like to introduce you to is the idea that you could take a positive word, okay, and by writing the word backwards, showing its negative reflection, you could reverse the word from a positive to a negative form. And so let's go back to this word live. If I were to write, for example, those letters backwards, what does it achieve? See how that works? Now that's one example of how it might work in English. But that's exactly what the rabbis were doing, okay, with Hebrew because it works quite often, a lot more than it would in our language. And so you have to understand that they're going to play with your heads by showing you reverses. Remember that technique because it will be important later when we get to the alphabet and grammar. There's a particular word which the anti-Mormons say that is absolute gibberish, which Joseph Smith has created, which we will introduce you to in the alphabet and grammar, and I want you to see if you can use tomorrow on it and tell me what it really is. Fair enough? So remember that technique. The next technique or school of thought I'd like to introduce you to is what's called the sacred tree of life or the tree of the ten sephirot. Now the tree of the ten sephirot or the tree of life is a structure of particular words that are used in a particular order which represents concepts relative to the plan of salvation. And in your handout, for those of you who have it, you will see this tree depicted so. Does that work? How many of you have ever been on a mission? Did you ever have a plan of salvation chart? This is the original plan of salvation chart. It's understood by the rabbis. It is one of the dominant structures of the Book of Mormon. It is the basis for the instructions which Joseph Smith gave the apostles at the School of the Prophets. This is the outline of the first four of those lectures, of long lectures on faith from the School of the Prophets. To kind of give you a Jewish-Mormon mix, okay, I'll try to take you through this tree so you can follow where we're going to go. At the head of the tree, they said, was God himself, and his symbol was the crown. <whistles> Whoa, that's not going to be a good one, is it? We're soon going to run out of pants. Now, his name was Elohim. The Jews would never pronounce it. They would say Hashem. His code name was Ain Soft. I am that I am. Remember Moses? Who shall I say sent me? I am has sent me, okay? I am the self-existent one. I am God, okay? On the next level down in this tree, in this structure, you see these little circles. Each one of the circles represent a concept. On the first layer of the top of this tree, we have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Now, in Western thought, we use these terms almost interchangeably, do we not? We can say he has knowledge, or we can say he has understanding, or he's wise. 
and we don't define them any differently. But to the rabbinical mind, they are three separate and distinct different concepts. Let me take you through it. This particular chart, which I've projected up here, is an apostate one, and we're going to use the Book of Mormon to put it back in its original condition before we're through. Under this one, you see that the Abba, or the Father, or the male, okay, is wisdom, and we're going to say that's wrong. That wisdom is a feminine attribute, okay? And that opposite the feminine is the masculine that understanding is masculine. What makes women wise? In the Greek, Sophia. Why are they wise? How does the feminine mind work differently than the masculine mind? You're saying you deal with emotions. I think women are more emotional. Spiritual. What we're going to say is the seed of spirituality, the intuitive intuition of the woman, okay? A woman's intuition is that which makes her wise. The husband comes, for, comes home and the wife has been sitting there feeling that she ought to go do something. He walks in the door and what's she say? Honey, we're going to go off to do the da da and he says, hold it, hold it. What? Why are we doing that? Let me think this thing through first. I've got to see why that is reasonable or logical for us to go do something like that. It seems initially to be foolish. What she do? She gets in the car and goes and does it. About the time she's down the end of the block, he finally figures out, what? That's a pretty more smart thing to do. Okay? And so you have these two approaches. One is the heart and the other one is the head. Now man and woman live together over a long period of time in a marriage and they what? Eventually they will grow together to be one to be one flesh. When they do that, a miracle happens. The woman starts to what? Think. <laughs> and the man starts to feel. Okay? And so when they're 60 years old and they're sitting there and they both look alike because they've been living together and sleeping in the bed, same bed, you know, they both look alike now. And what happens? The husband comes home and says, honey, I feel we ought to go do this. And she says, no, honey, let's think this thing through. <laughs> and each one of them is then what? Exchanged her attribute. Okay? So it's the reconciliation of the opposites. You remember Satan came and tempted Eve. Partake of the forbidden fruit, and this, thus you will make, it will make you what? Wise. wise. Why will it make her wise? Because then she will understand that everything has its opposite. So understanding the difference, or understanding the opposites then, is this layer. Only when you understand the opposites do you ever come to? Oh, no. knowledge. Okay, so you can see how that works with the mind the right and left portions of the brain. Now let's take it down to the next level. Let's talk about it in a sexual context, in a scriptural sense. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. Can you see how the same terms could be used in a sexual manner as also in a mental manner? That that is just two degrees and that the same symbols could be used in both those degrees? If you can begin to think in those ways then you'll begin to feel comfortable with this Kabbalic material and approach. And you'll understand better Joseph's attitude and how he did his translation. On the next level down in this tree of life, we are introduced to another set of opposites. In the Book of Mormon, we have great discourses about the relationship between mercy and what? Justice. Justice. See, they call it severity here. In the Book of Mormon, we're going to correct that. We're going to put justice over here. Are they both attributes of God? Must he have them? Yeah. Must we have them? Yeah. You see, if we're going to get back to God, we must climb this tree of life and we must eat all of its fruits. We must become like him. To become like him, we must have all of his attributes. Therefore, we also participate in this process of growth. So, if I reconcile in my life justice and mercy and have them in balance, 
according to this chart, what do I become? Beautiful. And so in the scriptures in Isaiah, we get these phrases. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him which published good tidings of peace. Why is there peace and good tidings? It's because there's judgment in the land. You're not accused of that which you did not commit. Neither are you punished unjustly. You get your just rewards. Okay. Who is the fruit of the tree of life? Jesus Christ. Can you see him here in this depiction? Can you see the crucifixion there? Okay. Now watch very carefully. That's the balance between justice and mercy. Can you see that the cross is a representation of the balance, scales of justice and mercy? Now to watch how perfectly this was understood in the ancient times and how cleverly the heavens have orchestrated everything to teach us this principle. Think now of the crucifixion. Go back to the book of Luke. They take the Christ and nail him to a cross. Then it says they bring forth with him two malefactors. One is crucified on the right hand and the other one on the left. The guy on the left looks over at Jesus and says what? He's got to say these lines perfectly for the script to be correct. He says, oh, if you are the son of God and you have all this power, then for heaven's sakes, get us down off of here. Is the man repentant? There's no remorse there at all. The guy on the right looks over at him and says, what? Hey, fool, shut up. This man in the middle, he has done what? Nothing. He is an innocent and upright man. Do you not fear God? We are receiving the just rewards of our deeds. Then he looks at Jesus and says, Lord, when you come to your kingdom, will you remember me? What did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. What's he going to get? Mercy because he's showing repentance. He has come to a consciousness of himself. He's come to know the difference between good and evil and has chosen the good and is willing to take his punishments in his repentant process. It's interesting that he's on the right, too. He's on the right. He had to be on the right. How did they know the other one? Now this one below is a little more difficult for us to fathom because sometimes we don't use these terms the way the others do. How do we use the term victory in the scriptures? Pardon? Victory over death. Victory over death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So we have victory over death in the woo, resurrection. Okay. Can I put that right there? I'm not going to get much out of that one. I hope that's a new one. Yeah, I think so. Opposite the resurrection, then, is a principle. Nice pen. <laughs> Opposite the resurrection, then, we have the term glory. The glory of God is, before we were spirits, we were intelligences. So we put intelligence out here, okay? Can I say that we were created then? Between our creation as spirits and our resurrection as immortals in exaltation, I'll write exaltation over here, what comes in the middle? Could I write mortal probation? <laughs> Mortality here. Okay. So this is a process that we go what? In and out of. Where is the, th where is the circle located? Over the loins. Because we're talking about the power of procreation. The power to create spirits. The power to then close spirits with flesh of mortality then the power to raise and exalt spirits. Okay? See how that works? 
So the Lord uses this phrase. Before I laid the foundation of the world, I knew thee. He laid the foundation. He is the Father. So the children become the foundation of the, the home. The husband and wife have children, then you've got a home. They become your foundation. Once you have your children, then what can you do? You establish your kingdom as a posterity. You see how that works now? In the briefest sense. Now, who brought your scriptures with you? Let's turn to a strange passage of scripture and see if it doth not have a familiar spirit. Let's go to, I, excuse me, D and C section 1. I'm going to ask someone to read for us in D&C section 1. Beginning in verse 23. Before we do that, what is happening in section 1? Who is speaking? Jesus Christ is speaking. Who is he speaking to? Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith is then giving to us, through the revelation from Jesus Christ, the introduction to the book of the commandments all right if you look the sterling would love this if you look at the total of the doctrine and covenants and when and the number of revelations were received and at what time section one comes at the very middle of the revelations so if the dnc is a chiasm section one then becomes the focal point if section one is the focal point, then what's the center of section one? This structure. You want to note that the tree of life theme and structure introduces all of the scriptures we have. Doctrine and Covenants, beginning of the Book of Mormon, beginning of the Bible, okay, beginning of the Pearl Great Prize. Okay. This is an important thing. If it wasn't important, they'd edit it out. But no, no, they emphasize it. So let's begin now with verse 23 and see if we don't see a pattern involved here. I'm going to have to erase this, aren't I? Someone begin reading, and then I'll stop you from time to time when I have the hankering. Okay? Is that the wrong word to use? When I feel the impulse? Okay. I'll read. Go ahead, sis. That the form of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak. Oh, stop right there. The servants have a weakness. What is it? The language. In what language is God, Jesus Christ, thinking? In the pure language. In what language is Joseph Smith thinking? In English. Very badly butchered English. So Joseph has got a problem. And he's weak in language. So he says, I'm going to think and I'm going to give you these. I'm thinking in pure language and I'm going to have to help you, Joseph, to get this in the English. And so I'm going to give you something right now. Pay attention to me, Joseph. Now go on, read. See if you don't see the pattern. That they might come to an understanding. Have you seen that word before? Go on. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known. And inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. And inasmuch as they sinned, they might be chastened, that they might repent. And inasmuch as they were humble, they might be made strong, and blessed from on high, and receive knowledge from time to time. And after having received the record of the Nephites, yea, even my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., might have power to translate through the mercy of God by the power of God, the Book of Mormon. And also those to whom these commandments were given might have power to lay the foundation of this church and to bring it forth out of obscure obscurity and out of darkness, the only true and living church for the faith of the whole earth, with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. Can you stop there? Did you see a pattern? It's like the tree. It is what? It is like what? tree that we just did. It's like it? It is it. It is it. 
What was Jesus when he was in mortal life? He was a rabbi. Is it any question then that he should use an ancient rabbinical structure to teach Joseph and apply it in this manner? Now, how would Joseph have known that? Remember, this is the, this is the farm boy who was, when translating the Book of Mormon and Emma was the scribe, you remember, he was looking into the hat and looking into the rock and seeing the words appear, and he's dictating. And he's looking through there, and he says, Emma, does Jerusalem have a wall around it? And Emma says, well, of course, Joseph. Everyone knows Jerusalem has a wall around it. And Joseph says, what? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, if this, ki if this boy is, has had such an education and a background that he doesn't know Jerusalem has a wall around it, how in the world did he ever fake that rabbinical structure? <laughs> Can you see the point? Was he restoring ancient things? Yeah. He was. Now watch how this structure works. Jesus has just given it to us so that we can understand better the process of the restoration of the gospel. But let's go, let's climb the tree. To establish the church, did he lay the foundation of the church by giving us the Book of Mormon? Did he couple with that the restoration of priesthood power? Did they move on to a place called Kirtland where the church went through an apostasy and they were divided? Sheep and goats, right hand and left. Did they move from there to a city which we call what? Which is in Hebrew what? Did they continue to receive their further light and knowledge by giving, getting the endowment and the rest of the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price? Did they then, once they had the endowment, could the male and the female be sealed together and therefore enter back into the presence of their Father in Heaven? So for the restoration to take place, it, he, he sent the light down the tree. And for us to get back to him, what do we do? Amen. We climb the tree. Now the Jews have this idea that you can climb three sections of this tree. But Jesus is showing you what? Straight is the way. way. You've got to cover all those bases. You've got to obtain all that fruit. And that's why Jesus gave it to us in a spiral depiction. Okay? The light came on. <laughs> well, this happens all the time to me, but my oldest son, who's in pre-med up at uh, Utah State University, one of his professors made the comment that the earliest known representations of the tree of life are a helix. I mean, ascending spiral. An ascending spiral. Uh, he's in pre-med? He's in pre-med. I think he said a double helix. Sure. I, I wish I had the, names man, the name of the man on my tongue. A few years ago, before I was more familiar with this tree, I saw an article in Scientific American where, where they were just coming up with the theory of quarks. Yeah. The Jewish uh, fellow who came up with the theories of quarks, upness and downness, charm and love, yeah. he built his theory of quarks around that structure. But they didn't want to let everybody know that they were what we're dealing with there. And I, and I thought, that is interesting, that the theory of quarks is tied to Kabbalah, but the scientists have no idea that that's what it is. Either an Indian or a Hawaiian representation of God is a spiral like this. Their hands signal is for God. I'm not sure which. <laughs> we just we just left a movie where we saw exactly that. Was it Indian? Huh? Was it an Indian? Yeah, it was called <laughs> the Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you want Indian stuff, the Navajo word for beauty is what? Balance. It's the same. Okay? Now, are you feeling more comfortable now with Kabbalah? That it's not a cult? <laughs> Can you see that you are in the process of climbing that tree, whether you're conscious of it or not? That we're all come into mortality, okay? <laughs> into the foundation of our own home. We see our children born. We see our parents die. They move on. The, here I am, the father, trying to judge all the time in my household how, how to deal with my rebellious children, the rugrats. I'm all the time trying to figure out how to mediate between the two, how to give mercy and justice in the proper proportion. And we teach love and get through this whole thing. And, and finally, we ascend through the tree. So we can be in the